So as Davey alluded to earlier, we're going to talk about a couple new concepts today. Number one being routing, and the other one being getting data from external APIs. So first, let's take a look at what we are actually going to make. As soon as I can find my cursor again. There we go. So this is what we're going to work on today. <coughs> a little app called API Party. Uh, so a couple things about this. You'll notice that first we are just at localhost 3000, so pretty much everything we've built so far has just been on like one single page, which is cool, but not typically the way most apps work. So now we have links. So you'll notice my URL actually changes, so now it's slash GitHub. And while the header stayed the same and the link stayed the same, I now have a different component rendered. And this lets us look up a username. Who wants to volunteer their username? What's your GitHub username? Wonder CM, right? And you'll notice that now it's slash GitHub slash Winder CM. Oh, look at that. He's so adorable. Oh, somebody, somebody, <laughs> somebody follow him. Come on. Well, we get all kinds of useful information like his avatar followers you can you can update your location so we get that uh, and then we get a nice link to his profile so that's cool that's one option we also have the nasa api so you also notice as we navigate the active link is styled differently than the rest and then so nasa's got a pretty cool api there's all sorts of data you can get from it you can like uh query for like i forget what they call it near earth objects that's a cool one. So you can see if any impending meteors are going to crash into the Earth. That's awesome. Uh, also, the one I decided to do was you can select a Mars rover and look at different pictures from it. So the front hazard camera is pretty sweet. Oh, man, are we over the rate limit for this? We might be. <laughs> uh, so theoretically, you would get a picture from that. I'm sorry that we're not right now. Um, so on the public one, without using a special API key. There is a rate limit for that. And I'm sure the people next door from the morning class are probably hitting that. So we might not be able to get a picture immediately. But trust me, really cool picture of Mars. But at any rate, so again, you can see that we're at slash NASA. And then as I click on different links, that updates um, what the URL is there and also changes what ends up being uh, displayed, which components are rendered. So that's routing. And then uh, there's also your homework link. But we're not going to worry about that yet. That's later. So how is this accomplished? Let's talk about that. All right. So React Router is what provides the routing solution for us. Now, important thing to understand is, as far as I know, React does not have like an official routing solution. This is probably just and it, this particular router is not made by the React team at Facebook, but it's probably the most used one. So pretty much if you're going to do routing, most people use this. So that's what we're going to learn. I have a volunteer to read this. I'm not going to make you volunteer for everything. Yeah. So on a normal website, like when you click a link for something like an A tag that has like an href on it, that's actually hitting the back end server, getting a completely different page, and that page gets loaded. In a React app, it's a bit different because we're not actually refreshing the page. It's just within the app itself. It's kind of pretending like it's changing the URL. So the URL is changing, but all that history and everything is handled by the React router itself. It'll make a little bit more sense once we get into it. But it's basically just making sure that we can do the same things that you would on a normal web page, like change the URL um, and have it render different things, but without actually refreshing the page. So you're staying within the context of your main React app. So for getting started, it's pretty simple. You just do a, either a yarn add or an npm install um, React Router DOM. So there's a few different React Router packages depending on what sort of app you're doing um, for a web project. It's React Router DOM. 
Um, and you don't need to run this right now. Uh, this will be within the context of a, a project that we're working on. Um, but that's the package you'll do. There's also packages for a router for um, like a React Native one if you're doing like a React Native app for iOS or Android. Um, but for our purposes, for a web project, we're going to use React Router DOM. And then it's pretty simple change. So everybody remember the React DOM dot render method. So this is what actually attaches our React app to the index.html. So before before we had a router, it was just the app tag would get attached directly. So now the only difference is we're wrapping our app in a router component. So now everything in the whole rest of the app is going to be within the context of a router. So that way the router can kind of control everything in the app. So how do we actually define a route? I'm glad you asked. So being React, it's just a component-based system. So once you've got React Router DOM loaded in your project, um, you can use route components, which are pretty simple. 99% of the routes you'll use are like that top one. Um, so you just say the route component, and then you tell it what path it needs to match. So like if I wanted to go to um, localhost 3000 slash widgets, and have it render a widgets component, then I would just say the path is slash widgets, and then I tell it what component I want it to render when that path matches. So pretty simple. Uh, the second one's a little bit more complicated, but not too much. So you note the first thing that's different about it is the word exact. Anybody have a guess as to what that might do? It's pretty much what you would think. So if we are trying to match a path and I tell it exact, that means it literally has to be exactly that. So for instance, in that first one, say in my URL it was localhost 3000 slash widgets slash bouncy. I want to look for bouncy widgets. That would still match the first one because it's just looking for slash widgets, which is still part of that URL. And so it would render the widgets component, whether I really intended that or not. If I want it to only match like exactly slash widgets and nothing else, then I would use the exact prop. So that way it's only matching when it's an exact match, not that plus whatever else. Does that kind of make sense? So you can use exact to make sure it's an exact match. Um, and then alternative to the component prop, you can also just pass a render prop where you're giving it a function. So you can kind of think of that as basically like a stateless functional component. So it's like you're just inline giving it a stateless functional component and telling it to render an H1. So but typically, you're going to use that top version, but you can also just give it a function to render something. So you don't have to actually define a full component if it's something really simple like that. So that's how you define routes. It would be nice to be able to get to the routes. And so there's also the link and nav link components. So we kind of mentioned if you use an actual A tag with an href, what happens when you click on an A tag? It's not a trick question. An A tag in HTML, if you click on it, what happens? Yeah, it just goes to a link, like to a different page entirely. But again, we're in a React app, so we don't actually want to go to a different page. We just want it to look like we did. So these are the components that let you do that. And so when these render, they look like normal links to the end user, um, but they're going to operate within the context of your React app. And they're pretty simple to use, maybe even simpler than an A tag, because you just have to tell it where they're going to link to. So like in this instance, our link goes to slash home. So when I click on it, it's just going to add slash home to the whatever URL I'm on. And then um, in between the opening and closing tag, you can just put what you want the link to say. The difference between a link and a nav link, there's a few differences. But typically, the biggest difference is nav link uh, knows when it is the active link. So like if I'm currently on the URL slash party, then navlink will know that, that's, that it's the active link, and it will put a class of active on that link so you can style it differently. So you saw when we demoed the app, um, 
when we were actually on a particular link, it was styled orange instead of blue. So it knows uh, when it's active and gives you that active class. Now, by default, it doesn't look different. You have to define that in your CSS, but you have that class automatically on there so you can utilize it. I'm sorry? How do you know if it's active? So like for this nav link, so if I'm at just on my local development machine while I'm making the website, and so the first part of my URL is localhost 3000, right? We're used to seeing that. And then if I have slash party after that, that slash party is going to match what this nav link links to. And so then it's going to know I'm, I'm the active link because the URL currently matches what I link to. And so then it's got to automatically put that active class on there for us. And last but not least, params. So params are like anything that's part of the URL but not part of the hard-coded part of it. So for instance, that might be the worst explanation I've ever given of that. Uh, <laughs> let's just take an example. So that top link goes to slash about slash Bob, right? And then my route is matching slash about slash some weird colon name, right? So that colon name is my symbol for a parameter. It means that when I have uh, in the URL something that's slash about slash something, it's going to assign that something to a parameter called name. So then I can access that in the component that gets rendered. So when we hit that link that changes our URL to slash about slash Bob, that matches the route slash about slash the symbol name. And it's going to render the user about component, which is defined down here. Now, the router automatically gives you um, three properties. So once you ha have your app enclosed in a router, every single component that's rendered within that is automatically going to get three properties. One is the match property, one is the history, and then the other is location. So part of that match property has access to the params that are passed. And since we said it was about slash name, that param is just going to be called name. So when it says this is a page about, and then we get props.match.params.name, what is that going to render as? Any guesses? Yeah. It is about Bob. Because Bob was our parameter in our route, and so I can access that through the match object through the params. And then our history object. So you know when you're browsing around, you can use the back and forward arrows. So your browser is normally keeping track of your history for you. So when you hit back or forward, it knows where to go. So again, in our React app, since we're not actually changing location, that won't work by default. So our router kind of has to take over that. And the way it does that is it keeps track of this whole history object. And so it basically keeps track of where you have navigated within your React app. And it also has some pretty helpful methods on it. So the ones you use the most um, are push. Push allows you to basically just go to a particular. So if I say history.push slash about, then that'll go to that, just like if I clicked on a link that went to it slash about. Um, I can call go back or go forward. That's the same as hitting the forward or back buttons in your browser. Um, you can just tell it to go and then pass it a parameter of a number. So like go with one as a parameter would be the same as go forward. Go with a minus one would be go backwards. But you could jump multiple things that way. So I could say go minus five, and that's going to go back five pages from where I've been. Uh, and then you can also block. So you can just tell it not to go somewhere which can be helpful in certain situations. So any questions about router so far? I know that's a lot of information, but really not that hard. The main thing is wrap your whole out app in a router, so that way everything is under the control of the router. Um, use the route components to tell it what things you want to match, and when you do match, what components to render. And then you can use links to get around. So not too bad. The other part of our app is getting data from the APIs. So we got data about the user from the GitHub API. 
And then we tried to get some data from the NASA API, but that didn't work so well for us. But <laughs> it will if a bunch of people aren't trying to do the same thing at the same time. So that is through a method called fetch. Can I get a volunteer reader for this part? Don't make Charlie do it again. Yeah, all the way from the back row. Thank you, sir. So the important part of that is it provides a global fetch method that provides an easy, logical way to fetch resources asynchronously across the network. So a lot of services provide APIs, which are just interfaces where you can request information from them. Um, and this used to be a real not easy thing to do necessarily in vanilla JavaScript. You had to use like an XML HTTP request and configure your headers and all that, which you can still do with the fetch method. But the nice thing is the simple version, which is just getting information from an API, is super easy now. So this would be a simple request. So the biggest part is you just say fetch. It's globally available, so you can just say fetch wherever. It's available on the main window object. So. Um, and then you just pass it a parameter of what URL you want to do a fetch request from or a get request from. So by default, it's just getting information from it. So if I have this particular, um, and I know this URL goes to an API, then I just say fetch from that URL, and it goes ahead and does that for me. I don't have to configure any headers or anything. And then we talked a little bit about asynchronous stuff which pretty much all HTTP requests are. So it's going to go and request information from that URL. And then when we get that response, it's going to be in like JSON format, right? Not always, but most REST APIs work that way. Um, so assuming this is a, an API that responds in JSON, then we take that response, parse it as JSON, and then that user that we get back, we can just log that. Now, the only thing that's part of this that you haven't really seen yet is the dot .catch. So when you are working with asynchronous stuff that returns promises, um, if anything in that whole chain of stuff that you do, all the dot .thens that you put on there, if anything goes wrong and has an error, you can just do a dot .catch, and uh, it'll catch that. And then you can do whatever you need to do with the error, so that way it's not just silently failing and nobody knows what actually happened. But yeah, so pretty easy. Just use fetch. You can use it anywhere. It's globally available. And just tell it what URL you want to get information from, and then it will do that for you. Any questions about that? Awesome. So let's go ahead and get our, it's really hard to do this kind of backwards. All right. Go ahead, and we're going to clone this repo first. So let's head to that website. Once you get there, we're going to go through our normal process. You're going to click on the fork link up here. And go ahead and fork that repo into your personal GitHub. Once you got that forked, then click on clone or download. And then just copy this link. Make sure you're on clone with HTTPS since you guys don't have access to the secure network. So just click that to copy. Everybody made it that far? Good, good. Once 
Once you got that, then go to whatever folder you want to clone it into. And then let me make that bigger for you. You're just going to do git clone and then paste in that URL that you just copied. I'm not going to clone it because I already have it cloned, but go ahead and do that. <coughs> Once you have it cloned, then just run does anybody not have Yarn installed at this point? A couple people. Okay, if you have Yarn, literally just say, spell it right, with for starters, just say Yarn, and that will do the install. If you don't have Yarn, then just run npm install. Also spell that right. Still not spelled right. There we go. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. First change directory into the API party folder. What does it say? It says no file Did you change directory into the folder? Yeah. Got it? Cool. And then last but not least, to make sure everything ran, uh, just do a yarn start to make sure your server boots up or npm start if you're on npm. Once you are successfully running your server, you are good to go ahead and take our official 10 minute break. If you have any issues, let me know. We can get those worked out.